you know, blue collar worker, his, chi his child going to an international school. They went as a captain, in two years they came back as a colonel. In the last 70 years, the biggest casualty in Pakistan has been the education system. But you've got to work hard at it. You just can't expect him to work and you not work. You've got to set it out. My name is Esani Ukazi. I am the head of computer science department at LAMS. It is my privilege and honor to be with Sayyid Babar Ali Saab today. Assalamu alaikum, Baba Saab. Assalamu alaikum, Saab. Baba Saab, today I'll use this opportunity to learn from you about your personal values, about leadership, and how to form a personal vision in life. So let me begin by asking you that in your view, what is a good life? A good life is a happy life, contented life, satisfied life, where um, you are at peace with yourself and at peace with others. I think that these would make a good life. Baba Sahib, one of the things that is very apparent when, when anyone meets you is your deep desire for learning, your curiosity. How should one inculcate uh, lifelong learning in one's life? Well, I mean, this has to be from inside. It, you can't force it. You've got to have people who are inquisitive. And I was lucky that um, my parents, uh, much more my mother, where I spent more time with her because my father was always traveling. And uh, my brothers, uh, they were, and you know, my father also, if I were to look back to his life, which uh, I'm now sort of reflecting on, he uh, didn't even finish school. Uh, he and his brother were, you know, sort of, they inherited their father's business, which was a fairly modest business. But uh, they, 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 they had to take it over because they, they were the only two survivors. They had an elder sister, of course, she was married. And um, so they, the way they educated themselves was by associating with people who were more knowledgeable, who were more experienced, who were older. And I think this is something that was transferred into my brothers and me by Jean. You know, that, um, you know, don't be scared of asking what you don't know. And uh, of course, you don't know much. So this was uh, a lifelong kind of a thing. Of course, my brothers, uh, especially the elder brother, he went to college. He was the first graduate who went to government college and graduated from there. And uh, they both went to Central Model School. And my second brother, uh, Sayyid Wajid Ali, he uh, was not uh, academic at all, so I think he changed three or four schools uh, and he finally got through matriculate, uh, matriculation and then joined government college. But he didn't stay long enough and my elder brother, who took a tremendous amount of interest in him, uh, put him into the army. In those days, there was uh, a, a category called Y cadet, people who were not commissioned but who had the ingredients and the making up that could they could be commissioned if they they if they conducted themselves well as a Y cadet in a regiment and as he was very fond of uh, riding and horses we had horses in the family so he happily joined 7th light cavalry which was based in Jalandhar in those days and uh, having sort of been inducted into a cavalry which was very snooty regiment uh, he uh, graduated into another level of conduct, behavior, his uh, being uh, naughty disappeared, he became more disciplined and then he spent a year out there, then he came back and joined the family business. So this um, idea of this um, habit of, um, of learning, then I of course went to Aitchin College which to get, again was a big breakthrough for our family and ancient college was, um, as you know, at those days in 1930s, 34, I went there. It was a chief's college meant for grooming of young boys who would always be loyal to the British. There was a lot of emphasis on um, 
grooming, tarbiyat, uh, the tutors uh, who were um, engaged by by the administration of the college were um, recruited on the basis of their personality, on their conduct, behavior, their background. They were not looking for academics. They needed people who would be able to to teach these young boys reading, writing, arithmetic, but uh, more on on being a good citizen who could be sort of um, brought into public life as members of the council or assembly, whatever the legislature was or be inducted in government. But I was the only person from the business community. So so it was, but there was a tremendous uh, opportunity for me, for me not to become a Nawab or a feudal, but to um, certainly conduct myself in a way that I uh, didn't bring any negative um, aspiration to the family. Thank you, Babar Sahib. Babar Sahib, the uh, famous writer Leo, Leo Tolstoy once said, there can be no greatness unless there is simplicity, goodness and truth. I've personally seen you in, in, in all meetings with students and faculty emphasizing, emphasizing the importance of imbibing universal values like honesty, integrity, humility. How should one nourish and develop these, these qualities uh, in oneself? Well, first you have to practice yourself. You can't preach something that you are not, you know, if you uh, overdress and expect everybody else to simply dress, that will not work. Uh, and in your behavior, if you're not polite to others, you don't expect others to be polite to their juniors. So you have to set it by example. And uh, somebody said a very interesting thing about my father uh, he, after he passed away, in fact, uh, uh, I'll say it, uh, he had it written, you know, engraved in marble and put it next to his grave. He said, Is shakhs ne dusro ko wo nasiyat ki jis pe pehle khud amal kiya. That he only preached what he practiced. And uh, this is something that uh, one would like to do it. Not always, but certainly you can try. Baba Sahib, it is often said that, you know, especially the young, when we meet them, uh, when they talk about sometimes honesty, they say, well, honesty may not always serve you well. And so uh, we find people taking shortcuts in life. In academia, we see sometimes cheating happening. What is your response to such? Well, I would not compromise on that. I have time and again talked to you and your colleagues that, um, you should inculcate this, um, make it make it absolutely mandatory that people have to conduct themselves properly. Because in later life, you know, one of the first things I learned uh, from an outsider, this was Mr. Reuben Rousing, you know, he uh, was the founder of the Rousing Industrial Empire, the Tetra Pak, and, uh, and again, the family is, I think, the single largest donor to Lums. You've seen the Rousing Center, you've seen the library, and they are being great benefactors to the School of Science and Engineering. He told me, Mr. Rousing, I was like a father to me. And uh, he told me, he said, the most important thing in your running a business is you've got to trust your people. If you can't trust them, then don't go into business because business only will survive if you trust others. And this trust will only come if you've got this discipline in your in your blood and your bones that you can't cheat. I mean, in our business, I've been now associated with business for over 70 years. And we have never ever uh, punished anybody for making a loss because uh, or making a mistake. Because if you don't make a mistake, you'll never learn anything. But we've never tolerated anybody who may have gone away with a rupee. He has to leave the company. And we make it clear to them the first day that there is no compromise on ethics. And I think in an academic institution, this is something that you tell the students the very first day. They may come from any background. That here, it is another ball game. You have to conduct yourself. 
we will not punish you for failing. But if you cheat, you are out. Indeed. Well, Sahib, it is, uh, you know, young, the young people often say that, you know, success is a matter of luck. And luck is oftentimes not uniformly distributed. What's your view about luck and success? Well, I think luck is very important. Uh, yeah, luck is very important. But there is no, no compromise on hard work. If you work hard, luck may, may escape you for a long time. But in the end, you will, you will be rewarded. You know, it's like going to the races and gambling. You may win the first time, the second time, the third time. But don't depend too much on luck. You have to, you have to earn that luck. You have to earn your spurs. You have to earn your whatever position you get in life through hard work and sweat. Uh, you yourself have seen, I mean, your your own career as a young undergraduate into Lums and then going abroad, getting your PhD. Uh, without that sleepless night, you couldn't be where you are today. Indeed. Thank you, Babar sir. Babar sir, uh, one of the things you know, I've observed in you, which I've personally tried to emulate, is that you are incredibly consistent with whatever you do. What keeps you going? I think that keeps me going. I mean, I don't want to fritter like a fly or a butterfly from flower to flower. If you want to um, embark on a journey, you've got to get to the end. You don't uh, sort of start too many fires and then run away from it. It's much better to do a few things, but do them well. And that is very important. Babar Sahib, now moving on to the topic of leadership. You know, in our country, we've seen that there is, for the most part, uh, a crisis of leadership. In your view, what is good leadership? A leader is something, somebody who doesn't look to himself as being important. He has to look after the people who acknowledge him as a leader. You don't become a leader by thumping your chest like a gorilla to say that I'm a leader. You have to be respected, you have to be loved, you have to be honored. And where you are thrust, where you, where you command leadership through fear. You know, at the first opportunity, somebody will poke a knife into you. This is what happened to Julius Caesar. You have to be loved as a leader. I mean, in our own history, I mean, Mr. Jinnah, he never spoke your language. He never, you know, never went to the mosque to say his prayers. Uh, he um, uh, lived a very modern life. Uh, people loved him because he was, not, he was an honest man. He was, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm your advocate. I'm, I want to, to um, fight for you for your rights. The Muslims were denied the rightful place in, in government, in society, in business. And uh, he felt that, and others felt that he was a person who could represent the Muslims without sort of trying to steal anything from them. He earned his own money. He traveled on his own cost and all that kind of a thing. He lived, lived uh, well because he was a very successful lawyer. But um, and a leader, leader has to look beyond his lifetime. He doesn't have to worry about getting elected. I remember I was in Bombay uh, when uh, the assembly election. Uh, to the, in those days, instead of the parliament in Delhi, it was called as the Central Assembly. And Mr. Jinnah had, um, he was elected from some area of Bombay. And um, he went to Delhi. He didn't even come to the, to this area for the polling. We were there at the polling station to make sure that people voted for him. He felt that if uh, people, uh, uh, if people uh, wanted, they will they will vote for him. If they don't want him, then he's he's not interested. And I tell you, very interesting um, incident in his uh, leadership. 
that uh, in one of the, you know, the Muslim League used to have an annual uh, Jalsa all over India, you know, different large cities. 1940 was in Lahore when the Pakistan resolution was passed. And then there was one in Lucknow, there was one in Calcutta, one uh, somewhere else, Delhi. So this was one of those um, annual meeting of Muslim League uh, party. And of course, you don't have any shortage of psychophants. And one person got up and he said, I propose that Mr. Jana be elected for life as head of the Muslim League. He immediately got up, he said, I'll never accept that. If you elect me for the year, I want to come back at the end of the year and to tell you what I have done. If you are satisfied and you still want me to, to represent you and vote for it, I'd be happy to do that. But you have the right to reject me and I don't want to be elected beyond a year. This was him. Babur Sahib, leadership is often put to test under crisis situations, under difficult circumstances. In your, in your view, how should one handle as a leader difficult times, crisis situations? Well, I mean, what one does if, uh, if and when you run into issues which uh, are unexpected, you certainly uh, uh, seek guidance and opinion from your colleagues, the one that are closest to you. You listen to them and uh, whatever you feel uh, is uh, something that meets your opinion also and which you see in the larger interest of the organization that you represent. You take the responsibility of taking the decision. If anything goes wrong, no blame is to be passed to anybody else. Even though the suggestion may have come from somebody else. You can't say that Asan asked me to jump into the canal, therefore he is responsible for my drowning. No, you are responsible because you jumped. Asan just suggested. So, leadership means that he gives credit for all, everything that goes right. And anything that goes wrong, he takes the blame. As you may know that, you know, John Hennessy, who was the Stanford, uh, Stanford's president for 16 years in his recent book, uh, Leading Matters, writes that one of the most important things in leadership is authenticity, which, which, is, which is often lacking. In your view, how can leaders develop and be, be authentic? Well, what is authenticity? Authenticity means you practice what you preach. You don't say one thing and you practice something else. So, it only means that inside and outside you are one. You don't have another shade inside. Babar Sahib, I've come across many successful people who are quite miserly about sharing their successes with others. And, and hence, uh, they do not collaborate with others and in, in the process limit their impact. But what I've seen in you remarkably is your ability to collaborate with and partner with people and you have these lifelong associations with them. How do you do this? Well, this is something that you grew up with. Where we were told right from the beginning, So it's an attitude. And I tell you, uh, you know, I can't thank my teachers enough when uh, you were on the playing field. You were all the time playing for the team, not for yourself. And if any of the boys, whether it was hockey or football, you were, irrespective of who scored the goal, the team won. And if you were to hog on to the ball and try to score the goal yourself, invariably you failed. And you passed the ball onto somebody who was in a better position than you to score. In cricket also, when you were batting and you had another player who was better than you at the other wicket, you let him face the, the balls because he'll score more runs. And what you were after is winning the match, not having a big score 
to your name. And this is something that was inculcated you on the playing field. And it stays with you for the rest of your life. And Baba Sahib, I would like to, you know, ask a leading question on this. I mean, you have built associations in, in, in wide ranging spaces, whether it be in education, businesses. How do you connect uh, with people in such a manner that, uh, you know, these, these long lasting partnerships have come about? You see, because, I mean, you know, you can't be a master of everything. You, um, if you, when we talk about other set up, other than education, of course, in LUMS, when we set up LUMS, we uh, went around the world to talk to people who were educationalists, seeking their guidance. How do we go about it? In the beginning, as you know, we were only a business school. So our main mecca of uh, inspiration was the Harvard Business School. So I made several trips to Boston to talk to the faculty there and seek their guidance and then and then find people who had been to Harvard Business School who were doing other things. Javed Hamad being one of them. He was at the World Bank. So I went to see him and I said, we want to do this. He said, that's a very good idea. I said, will you help us? He said, well, I'm at the World Bank. Can you get me leave of absence from here? So I had good relations at the World Bank. So I got him leave of absence for three years and brought him out to and then asked him to go back to Harvard to see what the new thinking was, how you should set up the school and to decide its um, methodology, the pedagogy. And uh, so we tried to learn from the very best and then see if you could emulate that. Babar Sahib, our conversation reminds me of 2017 when I was in Berkeley for my sabbatical. And, I, and one day I received a call from you and you said that uh, Asan, uh, there is a potential, there is a faculty at Stanford who is considering moving to Pakistan perhaps in three to four years time and it would be great to, ha you know, have him over for lunch, uh, you know, he can come and uh, perhaps be a LUMS faculty. And I still remember that you drove him all the way to Berkeley uh, and I was deeply inspired by your perspective and your vision that the, about the contribution that a faculty can make in the life of institutions. So can you share your perspective about, you know, your, your perspective about faculty, about, about teachers and, and the contributions to institutions? You know, over the years that I've um, been fortunate enough to uh, interact with, um, with faculty of different universities around the world, uh, I very soon realized and more so as time went on that the most important part of a university are not the buildings or its endowment uh, are faculty. Faculty attract students and students attract faculty. And uh, so you got to start somewhere and uh, we could not attract students unless we had faculty. So faculty to my mind is the um, foundation of any education institution. And faculty as you know uh, are, um, uh, excuse my expression, they are very individualistic. You know, it's like a, I don't know what you call it, it's like a pack of cats. Uh, they, they are very, they're very particular about their, their own personal uh, ambitions, their personal ideas, but uh, they are Without them, no university can exist. So our effort uh, so far has been, and I hope it will be there forever, that we need to get the best faculty. Uh, and uh, good faculty attracts better faculty. And uh, what we, my uh, plea to our faculty is that you should be hiring people who are better than yourself. That's the only way a university can grow, thrive, prosper. Indeed, indeed. Because what comes out of university, the product is, uh, is uh, has an unlimited potential. Uh, people who can go and conquer the world. And that is how you develop their thinking, their minds, their uh, 
ability to uh, think outside the box, to be independent and to challenge. They should not be boxed in into a particular way of your way of thinking or anybody's way of thinking. They should have the, the ability and the liberty to um, chalk out their own destiny. And that is how you get Salams and uh, Einsteins and people like that. And uh, somebody asked me about, you know, when we started this thought of School of Science and Engineering. And I said, um, my prayer would be that in the next 25 years, we will have a Nobel laureate coming out of Lums. Well, we are, you know, time is running out. We've done 20 <laughs> years. So even if it comes in the first 50 years, it will be a great achievement. Indeed, inshallah. So, Baba Sahib, moving on to the topic of uh, vision, you know, how should one develop a good personal vision in life? I think the compelling factor should be how can be, you be more useful to others? Not that you should be like a peacock strutting with all your feathers out. That's the last thing anybody should do because such peacock, peacocks get shot very quickly. You, I mean, the peacock, you know, opens up its tail and the feathers, not for your, your or my sake, it's going to attract a peahen to, 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 to breed. So once that factor in your life is over, you should, your, your main object in life is, how can you be more useful? Babar Sahib, with that, uh, you know, I'll, I have a follow-up question on, on passion and personal vision. So education is, your, is one of your deep passions. What drives your passion for education? If you look at uh, the development, I don't mean, well, development uh, both financial, economical, spiritual, it all comes from education. I mean, we as Muslims were inspired by the Quran, but it didn't stop there. It triggered off a lot of Sufis and poets and people who got their inspiration from the Quran, but they were not prevented from, from bringing in ideas which were not repugnant to the Quran, but in harmony with the Quran. You take Rumi, you take Iqbal, you take Ghazali. These people got their inspiration from there. And then, of course, you had people who were in science, who were in architecture, who were in building, who were in medicine. Uh, they, I mean, one heard that the Prophet um, encouraged people to travel. Go, to chi go to as far as China is concerned. And I've been um, listening to, um, to the lives of the great Punjabi Sufis. And the first lesson that a mature Sufi gave to his disciple was, for the next five years, I don't want to see you. You go and walk around and learn. And among these great Sufis of Punjab was Guru Nanak. He traveled over 30,000 kilometers in his lifetime. In those days, the um, way of acquiring knowledge was to travel, see, feel, smell, hear, meet people who know more than you. And of course, when it came to uh, learning from written word, you know, you had you had uh, people who had means or the authority, they uh, accumulated written material for the others to come and to, to learn from it. I was very, I was very thrilled to see the other day a, a library that was um, built in Timbuktu, all written, handwritten. I don't know in how many languages, but all by Muslims, running into tens of thousands of volumes, which are still there. I mean, you heard of the library in Damascus, you heard the library in Cairo, 
heard the library in in uh, in uh, in uh, in Spain in Cordoba, of course, uh, and then in, in in Morocco, in Fez. And today, one of the richest libraries in the Islamic world is in Istanbul, in Ankara, Turkey. So there has been a tremendous emphasis on reading, learning, but not for the sake of just learning, then practicing. And this is something that everybody has, all the great the thinkers have emphasized on, that a person who just reads and not practices is like a donkey with a lot of books on it. You've got to, you've got to practice what you have learned and then preach, share it with others, spread it around, just as it is mandatory that the money that you earn is, doesn't belong to you. It has to be shared and so is knowledge. Bhavar we talked about the relationship between success and luck. Can you share an example from your life where you felt you were very lucky? and also an example where you felt you were not lucky. I've never regretted anything. I've never missed anything. So I have um, always been thankful for what I have or what I got. Uh, I've been very lucky in, um, in thinking outside the box. You know, I mean, for instance, the company Packages Limited, which um, I was fortunate enough to be involved from the very beginning. Uh, I'd gone to Sweden for, for shopping. I had built a house in Karachi. I wanted some furnishings for it. I'd gone there. My architect who had been to Sweden, he said, that is the place to go and get something modern. So I went to Sweden, in fact, to Finland. And in Sweden, I uh, called on this company, Auckland Browsing, because we had a a razor blade industry at that time and they were pestering us that why don't you buy packaging material from us because Pakistan had no industry which produced, produced any packaging material. So I went to see him and there and then I said, instead of your selling this packaging material to me, why don't you come to Pakistan and we will put up a factory and we'll sell packaging material to everybody else. It was on the spot, thought. Another similar uh, uh, opportunity came. Um, I got a, a cable. In those days, you know, there was no telex or, uh, you know, the cable was, you got a telegram from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, from somebody who said, I'm from the National Development Corporation. This was an organization that had been set up by the Tanzanian government to look after all the industry that they had nationalized from the Asians who had put our factories there. And he said, I want to come and see you. I said, most welcome. So he came and sat in my office. Uh, he said, I said, what can I do for you? He said, I'm looking for a general manager for our packaging plant. So I asked him, I said, what happened to your last general manager? He said, he, we had an Englishman from England. And he met with an accident and he, he died on the road. And there and then it struck me. I said, why do you want to hire a, a man who can be run over? Why don't you hire a company that will not meet with an accident? He said, I never thought of it. I was not prepared that why he was coming. There was no briefing, no thought. Immediately, you know, I just threw this point at him. And what resulted was that we got the contract to go and manage this not only one company, managed four companies in Tanzania related to printing and packaging. And in these 10 years that we were there, 200 families from packages had the opportunity to go to Tanzania and their children to go to international schools. People who, you know, blue collar worker, his, chi his child going to an international school. So it was a fantastic opportunity. Harvard heard about it, Harvard Business School. And they sent a professor to come and write a case on it. Professor Lou Wells, he came out. 
and I, he interviewed these people who had been to Tanzania. And I asked him, I said, Professor Wells, what is your assessment? He said, you sent them to a better school than Harvard. They went to Tanzania, they had to take decisions, they had to manage the company. And in those days, communications were not there. You gave them responsibility, then they delivered. They went as a captain, in two years they came back as a colonel. And it all came as a thought across the table, why don't you hire the company? So this was luck. And I think I can't thank God enough for giving me this opportunity. This is wonderful, Babur Sahib. And Babur Sahib, in your life, have you ever faced a situation where you felt that you were unlucky? No, no, I've lost a lot of money. I've invested in businesses which went belly up. But that didn't deter me. Get on with the ones that are walking in, concentrate on those. Forget about the past. Don't cry over spilled milk. Forget it. Uh, we had a manager, uh, he was an elderly person. He had, he had tutored my elder brother. So, when um, he wanted a job, we gave, he became a manager of one of our companies that was based in Pindi. And everybody respected him because he was a he had been a tutor to my brother. I was at that time working for the Fertilizer Corporation. I was, had joined the government. And I arrived in Islamabad airport and he came to receive me. And he said, um, you know, today's paper said that one of our companies had been nationalized. Four companies had been nationalized already by Mr. Bhutto. This was the fifth one. And my face fell. And he said, Mia, don't worry about these things. And I can't thank him enough. He said, forget about these things. They come and go. You concentrate on the job that you have. So if these things, you know, pull you down, then you will be crying forever. Baba Sahib, you have built uh, many institutions. And one of the hallmarks of this, these institutions uh, have been their, has been their sustainability. How should one build sustainable institutions in this country? I tell you, there are many prerequisites. I think the most important thing is who is going to run it. You select the person because um, uh, anybody can build something. But to run it, to manage it, and to, um, to set a solid groundwork, you need somebody with ability, with vision, with industry, with capacity. Of course, uh, the other thing is you've got to have enough gas in the tank. You can't start a journey without having enough gas to get you there certainly to the first destination. And if you do a good job, then you will find a petrol pump on the way. So you have to win the confidence of people that their money will be well utilized, well applied, no wastage, no leakage. And you've got to first fill the tank yourself. You, the first gallon, you can't ask anybody else. They want to know how much skin or stake you have in the project that you want to promote. So these are very important ingredients. And its sustenance is, if it, is, it makes the right product, right quality at the right price, or in education, if you're giving the right kind of education, because students are very particular to choose where to go. They will not come to an institution where their degree will be at a discount, where they won't get a job. And I must give credit to the first two, three batches that came to the business school. We were totally unknown. And they took the risk to come to an unknown place, primarily because some of the sponsors they knew of who had done, who were successful in life. You know, Razak Daud was there. He was 
at that time working for Daud Hercules, which was a very successful fertilizer company, uh, and he was teaching at uh, Punjab University. Uh, I was associated with, with uh, packages. So, and Dr. Parvez Hassan was a successful lawyer. So they said, these people are not wanting anything for themselves. They're not going to use this enterprise to make money. They are doing it because they are wanting to um, provide good managers to people who can't afford to train. And they are also they're going to provide skill to people to become good managers to get good jobs. So that was a kind of a good combination of uh, here. Luck was important. Entrepreneurship was important. Risk was important. So all these things uh, fell into place. Mera to iman hai ki agar aapki niyats thik ho na, if your intentions are right, that you don't want to exploit anybody, you don't want to do anybody down, you can't go wrong. Baba Sahib, talking about sustainability, what I have personally observed in you is that you have been given a lot of time to institutions. For instance, at the Sayyid Babali School of Science and Engineering, I've seen you in every advisory board meeting from start till the end, participating, being focused, getting perspectives and views, giving so much time to an enterprise that you, of course, love. How much has that contributed to the sustainability of institutions that you have been a part of or, or you have Well, uh, I mean, developed? take for instance, you know, take, take your um, advisory board. Now, these are people who come from the top echelon, senior position in the top universities of the world. They travel tens of thousands of miles to come here. We only pay for their travel and they're living here. And if they can take that trouble to come and share their experience, to guide you, to tell you what to do and what not to do, I, who I was living here, should be listening to them and to tell them that we value their visit and we are listening to them. And as a, I'm a part of the, your school, to say that we will take the responsibility of implementing your advice so that they are keen to come next time. If you don't follow their advice, they say, we have no time to waste. So you have to tell them that you value their, and the only way you can value their visit is to be there to and to learn from them. And these have been a very rewarding and a very educational uh, kind of interaction of these meetings. I mean, you've been sitting there, how much you have learned in those four days of their visit here. Indeed, Babar Sahib. And Babar Sahib, uh, continuing on, on, on the point of institutions, in the government sector, we see many institutions that are not well managed, uh, that have systemic issues in them. In your view, when such systemic issues in institutions are in place, how should one work to bring or address those systemic issues in a fundamental way? You see the problem, what's gone wrong with our government and institutions is that merit has disappeared. You know, I um, had the um, possibility of b being the convener of selecting vice chancellors for the University of the Punjab for about almost 10 years. You know, there are maybe over 100 universities in the Punjab. And every year I was interviewing at least two to 300 candidates. And I was so sad that after two or 300 candidates that we interviewed, I was one of the four people in the panel, that I could not even recommend two or three individuals that should be looked at, but that, that LUM should look at hiring them. They have such a poor quality. Because um, in the last 70 years, the biggest casualty in Pakistan has been the education system. They always selected the weakest member of the cabinet and with no very meager resources. The salary of the teachers starting from primary school to high school to college, these were, they could, I mean, you could only get 
people who would be not employable anywhere else. And then again, the selection there was on the basis of who you know, where you come from, how many votes you can bring to the local MPA. The whole thing has been totally corroded by lack of merit. And that has destroyed your higher education in the country. And uh, unless you, um, you, um, you set that right, that merit comes back, uh, things will not improve. I don't know of a single student or a single faculty or a single staff that has been employed at LUMS on the basis of other than merit. We've run into a lot of trouble by sticking to this thing. Uh, but we have not, uh, we have not given in. You've seen it. Absolutely. Babarsab, this reminds me of uh, an incident, an interaction that I had with you when I joined LUMS as a faculty. I remember going to a TGIF and I was always very curious about asking this uh, from you one time. You know, I, I remember asking you, Babarsab, I've seen many people build institutions, but, you know, building sustainable institutions, something which is like, like you have done is something which is remarkable. How did, you, how did you do it? And I remember you raised your head and you said it's God's special grace. There is luck and uh, Almighty's nothing happens unless He wills it. But you've got to work hard at it. You just can't expect Him to work and you not work. You've got to set it out. And Babasab, just to continue on that, I see that many people, when they become successful, they become arrogant, uh, they start looking at, at, at themselves as, you know, full of knowledge and nothing new to learn. How do you sustain your humility? Well, this is something that was inculcated by, primarily by my father. And he, he did it, he maintained it. He um, was a self-made man. He went to the top, um, you know, you couldn't go any higher as far as honor and recognition is concerned as a successful businessman, as a respectable businessman. Not the richest, but quality-wise, honorable. And he was as humble at the end as he was in the beginning. Professor, so my... Uh Last question from you is about self-renewal. We see that people as they age in life, uh, some people, you know, stop learning, stop, uh, you know, listening even. Uh, how should one renew oneself over time in life? Well, one is you've got to watch your weight. You've got to watch your body exercise. Keep your mind engaged. Interact with people who are intellectuals, who do not just waste, who just doesn't waffle. People who would, you know, add something to your knowledge. I mean, give you something. Even last week, we were discussing with Mr. Naveed Riaz about Jamshed Marker. He said, have you seen his book called Cover Point? I said, no, he sent me the book. And I finished it in three days. And it was so rewarding because he dis discussed many of the personalities of Pakistan, which I also saw and he only confirmed, but also added more to what I knew. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm all the time looking for, um, for how I can learn more, but it has to be of interest to me. Thank you, Babur Sahib. No, I found it very rewarding. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope it will be useful. working relationship with the two presidents of WWF. How would you explain that bond? I was vice president and I was to sit at the table of Prince Philip. And when Prince Bernard saw that I was not on his table, he insisted that I sit on his table. That was his, his graciousness and kindness. Mm -hmm.